So now, money, the business of journalism. It's true as a reporter, it's true in life. You want to follow the money if you want to understand why people do what they do the way they do it, how things got to be the way they are. So why worry about business? Because I, as I said before, I want you to be the leaders of this field. That means of this industry, of the companies in it. I want you to be responsible stewards and protectors of journalism. And I want you to be able to make your own best decisions about what paths are best in your career and what are too risky. I came about this the hard way, you might say, because I started the magazine Entertainment Weekly 30 years ago, I hate to admit. And when I was there, I was there because I had the idea for the thing, but I didn't have any business experience. So the business side wouldn't listen to me. And they made mistakes. I made a few too, but they made some pretty big mistakes. No one would listen to me. And I finally decided that I could no longer protect my baby, and I left. And I vowed then that I would learn the business of journalism so that would never happen again, so I could protect the journalism that I cared about. That's why when I came to Newmark, I helped start the program in entrepreneurial journalism with Jeremy Kaplan so that we could teach journalists the business of journalism. We could also help them start new businesses in journalism because I think that's the way we're going to save this industry, this field, this craft, this trade. So let's talk about business. I want to start with what I call the myth of mass media. Remember I talked before about mass as, a, as an insult to the public and all the other problems with the idea of the mass. Well, the mass, starting with steam and the penny press, is also the basis of the business model of media. We want to get as many people as we can to see our content so we can sell the attention of that audience to advertisers. And the myth of mass media is this. All readers see all ads, so we charge all advertisers for all readers. Let me say that again. The myth of mass media is that all readers are going to see all ads. Thus, we can charge all the advertisers for every reader, whether or not they actually saw the ad, right? So maybe you buy uh, the New York Daily News for the sports section, and you never look at the rest. Doesn't matter. The Daily News wants to charge all those advertisers for your eyeballs and your attention even if you didn't look. And that worked in print. It worked in broadcast because the advertisers couldn't know who was paying attention and who wasn't. So every page that was flipped had an ad on it and they were charged for your eyeballs. Well, then the internet came along and ruined all that, but we'll get to that in a minute. So newspaper circulation started falling in the U.S. after World War II, partly because uh, television came along and it killed newspapers and there were just simply fewer newspapers to subscribe to, but also because there was competition for our attention and time. People were watching television, listening to the radio and driving around and they bought free newspapers, partly because people starting in the 70s had less trust in the newspaper industry. And this is something that we have to grapple with as a field. People talk about regaining trust in journalism. Well, since the 70s, our trust has been falling. And since forever, some communities that feel they're not represented in journalism never trusted us. So we have never been that paragon that we would like to think we are. Point is, for business, circulation was falling from World War II on. And it continued, and it's going off a cliff now. But newsprint, paper sales, went up over the same time. Why? Because newspapers ended up in monopolies. They were beautiful things where they could control the pricing and they could add sections and add content to put around more ads. They could charge more for them and they became thicker and the owners became fatter. And they could, good news, hire more journalists. So it was a lovely thing while it lasted because those publishers controlled a scarcity. The press, the space, the audience, the pricing. And they made more money in a top 30 market in the U.S. at the absolute height in about 2000 before the tech crash. A newspaper in a top 30 market that I know of would bring in, in job ads alone, about $40 million in revenue. Poof! It disappeared. It was gone. $40 million. Gone. And that was just job classified. It happened in all the other areas. And the problem was that the mass media business model no longer worked. It always had problems. There wasn't a lot of diversity. There wasn't a lot of relevance. It was attention grabbing. It wasn't the paradise that we should return to. But it was a lucrative field that paid for a lot of journalists. So what killed that? Well, let's start here and be very clear. 
no, you at the Craig Newmark Graduate School of Journalism should not presume that Craig Newmark killed newspapers. He didn't. The internet kills middlemen. And so advertisers can go directly whenever they want to, whenever they can, to their customers. Indeed, when I brought my friend Craig in to talk to the students here at the school early on in, in our life, I think it was maybe the first year, and students asked him about this. And he said that he saw himself as a philanthropist of classified ads. That is to say that the money that had been going into the pocket of the newspaper publisher now stayed in the pocket of the seller or the customer. And, and so they had more freedom to do with their money what they wanted. But it didn't take Craig to do that. It was going to happen anyway because the internet kills middlemen. The other thing the internet does is it kills scarcity in favor of abundance. We in the media business controlled, once again, a scarcity. That's how we had monopolies. That's how we made a lot of money. I own the printing press. You don't. I decide what goes on it. I decide what it costs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, the internet comes along and, of course, it has an endless amount of content, of advertising opportunities, of audience. And Google then changed the fundamental model of advertising. Now, in most cases, if you look at a search ad, Google gets paid only if someone clicks on the ad. We call it cost per click advertising. Thus, Google aligns its interest with those of the advertiser. That is to say, Google takes the risk. Google says, Madam Advertiser, if nobody clicks on your ad, you don't pay me. I don't make money, you don't pay. So it became in Google's interest to find a way to make that ad work more effectively so that it would get paid. And so the advertiser would get a customer coming to them. That's why Google decided that they had to branch out beyond just search to put ads all over the internet. If Google had operated like an old media company controlling a scarcity, it would have said only so many people search on the word Paris or London in a day, and we will charge what the market will bear for that scarcity. But Google didn't say that. Google said, we will charge only if somebody clicks on your ad. So Google's interest was to try to find more relevant content across the entire internet. And that is why Google started putting ads onto anybody's website. The New York Times, my little blog. I never made more than a latte's worth in a month, but I for a while had Google ads on my blog. Google analyzed the content, decided what the relevant ads would be to put there in the hopes of increasing that relevance. And it worked well. Um, Google then opened up revenue across the web, right? It supported a lot more media. It pays out to this day a lot of money to media. Google also opened up to an entirely new population of advertisers who could never afford media, who could never afford print or radio or broadcast. You know, your little eyeglass store on the corner who now could buy a Google ad could never have afforded to buy in the newspaper. Meanwhile, newspapers didn't change. And so they lost. Now, the internet made mistakes too. It imported the fundamental model of media advertising because that's what advertisers were used to and nobody wants to argue with the person who has the checkbook, so they kept selling it. This is a model based on attention, on selling your eyeballs. Right? That's, that means that both media companies and internet companies are competing to grab your attention and your time. And this leads inevitably to cheap tricks and sensationalism, to cats and Kardashians, and ultimately, I would say, to Donald Trump, the clickbait candidate. Clicks are corrupting. So let's talk about how advertising works, how it's sold. There's brand advertising, right? If I say a brand to you, McDonald's, Nike, uh, Google, certain things come to your head. Now, that could be because you think McDonald's is delicious or, or dangerous or is giving diabetes to people. Depends on what you think of McDonald's. McDonald's tries to advertise to get the idea across to you that it's fast and delicious and wonderful, right? And they do that through marketing, through advertising. That's called brand advertising. And the way it's paid for is by how many thousand people see the ad. It's called CPM, cost per me. And so I look at that as a ton of eyeballs, two eyeballs times a thousand. And the advertiser in this case says, I'm going to buy N thousand impressions for N thousand people to see my ad. Now, in that case, the advertiser is taking the risk. 
if the advertiser puts an ad in Entertainment Weekly and nobody likes the ad, nobody cares about the product, nobody goes to buy it, that's the advertiser's tough luck. EW still got the money, right? Unlike Google, that was the old way of advertising. But advertisers pay money with brand advertising to be in environments, premium environments. Right? If you buy an ad in Vogue, it's a way of saying, look how fashionable I am. Right? Um, the problem though with this notion of environment of, of media quality in that sense was that the environment became less valuable over the long run than the data about the consumer, the consumer's interest, the consumer's intent. So you all know what happens. You go to Amazon, you look at a pair of boots once, and those damn boots follow you around all around the internet everywhere you go for six weeks. And maybe you actually bought the boots, but they still follow you around. By the way, that just means it's dumb advertising and dumb technology. And every time you think that technology is all knowing and dangerous, remember those boots. It's dumb. The internet is not that smart as you fear, perhaps. So anyway, this is a combination of what's called retargeting advertising and programmatic advertising. Retargeting in the sense that somewhere along the line, you looked at boots and that information about you followed you around on the internet and uh, your boot interest was now known so that I can go anywhere you are. I can, well, you can be on weather.com, you can be on vogue.com, you can be on wired and I can show you the same damn boots, right? Well, how does that happen? That happens through programmatic advertising, which is a phenomenal and huge and new industry that was started uh, in, in great measure by one company and then Google became, uh, as it tends to, a major force in it. So in programmatic advertising, let's say that I'm the, the, the boot interested consumer and I come to your news website. I come to uh, cleveland.com. And at that moment, uh, I say, hello folks, I've got a boot guy here. I got a guy, he's a boot guy, who wants them? And Amazon says, I want them. And Macy's says, I want them. And um, a shoe store says, I want them. Well, they all have a price of what they're willing to pay. And in an instant, in that moment, when you are opening that page, the auction is occurring behind the scenes automatically. And then pay less shoes wins. And then the pay less ad is downloaded and put in and served to you and your eyeballs. That's how programmatic works. The good news to media companies of programmatic is they say, hey, I can get all kinds of new advertisers I never got before. The bad news is that it commodifies media. What it says is the advertiser doesn't give a damn where their ad appears. It could be on a weather story, a sports story on cleveland.com. It could be on anywhere. And all they care about is that, is that I care about boots. So they're going to show me that ad. Right? And the idea that we sell this special environment for advertising um, no longer holds true. So we lose our premium value as media. We got the short-term revenue of programmatic. We had to because that's where the advertisers were going. We really, really didn't have much choice. It's not really Google's fault. It's the advertiser's fault. But we ended up losing in the long run. So there's the state of advertising. Um, there's another kind of advertising, and it's called direct response. In a sense, this is, this is also like the boot ad, right? This is, says that, that it's a cost per click or a cost per action or a cost per sale. And that is to say that uh, in direct response, the media gets paid if the person actually buys something. So if you come to my blog and you see boots and you decide to buy them, only if you decide to buy them, not just click but buy them, I make some money. Advertisers love this because it's performance-based. Only if people actually buy stuff do they pay. Media don't like it because they don't control the ad. They don't know whether it was the 20th time that it was seen. Maybe you went on to buy the boots, but in the meantime, you looked at another site and you didn't get credit for it. Um, but there's a lot of direct response advertising on the net. Then there is classified advertising, as I mentioned before. Classified advertising had to be a marketplace. Right. Back in the day, if you wanted to sell your used car, your 84 Mustang, you had to go to where people were who were buying cars. And the only place where that was happening was the newspaper. So you paid a fortune for a little tiny ad to run for weeks in the hopes that someone who wanted your Mustang would see it, call you, buy the car. Right? Then what came along? Yes, of course, Craigslist. But it wasn't the only mechanism. 
auto dealers realized that they could start their own websites. They could put up their own inventory. They no longer needed media. Yeah, you still might see some ads in newspapers, but that was really to say, hey, we're a wonderful uh, car dealer. You really love us. We're not pains in the ass. Same thing happened with jobs. Right? Companies started their own job placements, and then companies like LinkedIn managed to become marketplaces for people and for employers. Uh, same thing for homes. Real estate agents got their own websites, and they realized the value they had was the data about what houses are for sale, because everybody wants that. They controlled that. The newspaper didn't. Uh, then merchandise, right? You want to sell your piano. Where do you do that? Craigslist. So all of those areas of advertising disappeared. They just plain disappeared over a pretty quick period. So you had newspapers that were feeling fat and sassy even in the beginning of the internet suddenly see this implosion of their revenue. That's a lot of what happened. At the same time, by the way, they tended to think, uh-oh, we better get some market power, so we better buy each other up, so we're going to borrow a lot of money to buy each other, and then that's what leads to where we are today. I'll come back to that. So there's a couple more forms of advertising. Another one that was very big was directory advertising. If I was seeing you all right now, I would have you raise your hands and ask you how many of you have ever used the Yellow Pages. I can't remember the last time I did. The Yellow Pages was a form of advertising in which you had to be there in case anybody ever looked you up, right? If you're a plumber and all the other plumbers are there, you got to be there. And it sold kind of fear of being left out. Well, of course, that goes away because why? how do you find a plumber now? Well, you Google the plumber or you go to next door and find a neighbor who recommends a plumber. You don't need the Yellow Pages anymore. That disappeared. Google entered into the brand advertising market. It's part of the directory market. It is a huge force in advertising. Then along comes Facebook, and Facebook has more data about users. And we can argue and debate about privacy and all those issues, but let's leave that aside for right now and just look at the business. Um, Facebook comes along and says, I can help you target ads just to people in this area who have these characteristics, uh, who might be interested in your bar because they're young and they're part of yours, right? And that made it possible to target advertising much more efficiently. Some people say that targeting is an awful thing and it can be misused. But I would also remind you that it's because of targeting and efficiency that a small business can finally advertise without big media and the business is better off. A small candidate and a small campaign can start because of targeting because it's more efficient because they can't afford to be on TV. Indeed, we don't want them to be controlled by big money on TV. So that's the atmosphere in which we find ourselves now. And advertising will continue to decline as marketers find that more and more they can build direct relationships with their customers. That is their ideal. They don't want to market unless they have to. Advertising is failure. If your customer recommends your product to a friend, that's great. It's free. If you don't have that, if it doesn't work, if people don't know your product, you have to advertise. It's failure. And you do it only as long as you have to. Now, we're going to depend upon advertising. If there's no advertising tomorrow, journalism is screwed. We need advertising to continue as a business. We need it to help subsidize us. It has subsidized us for a long, long time. But we have to help reinvent advertising, I believe. So then you might say, okay, 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 Jarvis, you're wrong. Screw it. Give up advertising. Paywalls. Paywalls will solve everything. Everybody's got one now. That's the solution. Not so much. For one thing, in a world of abundance, there will always be a competitor who can undercut you. You charge a $20 prescription, subscription, somebody else charges $10, and somebody else is free. Now, the free person may not be as good as you or the $10 person, but it may be good enough. And the truth is that money tends to go into crowds, and consumers only spend what they want to spend. Nothing you can do about that. So in America right now, about 70% of subscription revenue goes to the top three publications, and you know what they are. And so all of the rest split the rest, the pennies. And then there's the dynamics of subscription. Nobody talks about this. It's something I learned in the magazine business. It's also true in newspapers. First, there's a cost of subscriber acquisition. That is to say, you have to spend money, you have to market, you have to advertise to get a subscriber. At Entertainment Weekly, it was costing upwards of $35 each to get a subscriber. At a fancy magazine like Traveler, it could cost 
35 40 50 dollars at traveler it was when it was thick and, and and fat it would cost up to five dollars to print and distribute and, and they'd only charge one dollar an issue in a subscription so they were losing a fortune on every subscriber on the basis of subscriptions alone but of course they made the money on advertising because the myth of mass media Every reader sees every ad, so we charge every advertiser for every reader, and we get as many readers as we can. This is what denotes how we made our products. So if you look at a newspaper over time, remember I started in the history that it started as just a VC and boring little tidbits from each other. And then comes the mass media and comes advertising. Now suddenly you can be more things to more people. And so now suddenly you add in a lot of features and products to keep more eyeballs. You know, why, does, why did a newspaper in the day have a bridge column or a gardening column? How many gardeners are there really? How many bridge players are there left? But they didn't want to lose a single reader because that reader was valuable to them to sell to every single advertiser. Follow the money. The reason a newspaper looks like it looks is because of this dynamic. If you look at sports in newspapers, if you're not the New York Daily News or the New York Post, which are sports newspapers, uh, then in many, many papers across the country when we had sports, readership for some was 20% or lower. And there weren't, we call it endemic ads in those sections. There weren't a lot of sports ads. People didn't put in ads to get a season ticket to the Giants. So the only ads that really appeared there in a sexist presumption was tire ads and auto ads because they thought that men bought those things and men watch sports and that's where they put their ads. Again, all sexist, but that's the way it worked. The point is sports sections on their own were not profitable. They were profitable only because they brought in those 20% of rabid readers who even if they threw out the whole news section and the food section and the gardening section and the book section, but they just wanted the paper for the sports section then you could sell their eyeballs to every advertiser. It was a beautiful thing while it lasted. So that's why we were willing to lose money on marketing to get subscribers, because in the long run, they were worth it to us. The other dynamic in subscription is what we call churn. That is to say, who quits, who leaves you, right? Quibi, the new service that was supposed to start to bring everybody into entertainment online, Got, uh, they lost 90% of their trial users uh, when it started. Uh, Disney, on the other hand, right now, is selling subscriptions like crazy because people want to watch Hamilton. And we'll see what happens in two or three months if those people stick or leave. Right? And if they leave, you have to market and spend money to acquire someone to replace them just to stay even, let alone to grow. The Sun in London, which is a tabloid, even tabloidier than the Post here, um, tried to have a paywall because Rupert Murdoch, the owner, believes in paywalls, believes people should pay, it had a churn rate of 120%. That is to say, every year it was losing every one of its subscribers plus another 20% it got and had to replace them all just to stay even. They got rid of the paywall. So, let's be honest. A lot of people think now that they're going to have paywalls, that everybody should have a paywall, that it's the way to save themselves, but... Not everything that's behind a paywall is worth it. I do pay for the New York Times, and I pay for the Washington Post, and I pay for the Atlantic, and I pay for publications that I care about. But there's some publications I go to once or twice a month I'm not going to pay a subscription for. And I'm better off with a full-time salary than any of you are. And even though you'd like to see all that journalism, I'll bet, if we could show, have a show of hands, that many of you don't pay for many subscriptions. So are paywalls the salvation to journalism? No, afraid not. Let's go now to the other side of the business ledger, the cost side. We remain a very inefficient business. As many journalists as we are losing, we still waste money on stuff because of this myth of mass media and mass advertising. We believe we've got to have our own stories on our own pages with our own ads to get our own pennies. And so that motivates us to just fill pages as inexpensive, inexpensively as we can, even with crap. That's why you see a lot of clickbait out there. So you might remember a few years ago, there was a story that BuzzFeed had about a two-color dress. Some people thought it was this color. Some people thought it was that color, right? And I remember going to journalism conferences, and I would say to the whole audience, how many of you wrote that story, had a story like that in your publication? 
everybody raised their hand. Everybody rewrote BuzzFeed. Is that the best use of journalistic talent and resource in this time of scarce journalistic talent and resource? No. But everybody did it because of the business model. Follow the money. They had to have their own dress story because it was the hot trending thing. And if anybody searched or came across it, they wanted to grab their eyeballs and their attention. So they rewrote BuzzFeed and created their own story and put a byline on it and said, this is our story, even though they really hadn't done anything. That is a waste. But it's a waste that our business model drives us to, right? And I think we've got to reset our business around true value. And I see it happening in some places. One way to reset that value is to collaborate. The city here in New York, which Dean Bartlett helped start, uh, collaborates as a not-for-profit with all the media in New York and its journalism can be used by them. That's a way for those journalistic outlets to save money, report more journalism. It's a way for the city to get more distribution. It's a good thing. Another thing we can do is concentrate on what matters. The Guardian and The Telegraph and The Correspondent, three publications out of Europe, each, a couple of years ago, went through a content reduction scheme where they realized they were pumping out too much content. They were pumping out three, 400, 500 pieces of content a day. No one could read all of that. They did it because of the myth of mass media. As The Telegraph went to a, a, a paywall model, as De Correspondent started by charging people as members, as The Guardian went to a contribution model, they all said, you know what, we've got to reduce this content uh, because it's costing a lot of money. A lot of things aren't being read. And in the case of the correspondent, the readers begged them to produce less because it was too much to read. So if you concentrate on what matters, this is a way to reduce the cost of journalism. All right, so we've gone through advertising. It will continue, but it needs to be reinvented. We've gone through subscriptions. If you are really good, if you are number one in the market, if you are unique, if you are valuable to people making money, you can make it with subscriptions. If you are not those things, I don't think you can. So we come to other revenue models. One that I like is membership. In membership, you're not really just buying access to content. Think of it this way. We need to look at new tribes, new rewards, and new contributions. When I say a tribe, I mean an affinity. That rather than saying that I'm a member of the New York Times, I don't think I'm a member of the New York Times. Or do I, right? When I give money to the New York Times, I think it's almost a contribution. I support the New York Times because it's important journalism and we need it. I'm not just paying for access to content. I'm paying because I care about that. A lot of people who've given money to The Guardian gave because they cared about certain things The, Gov the Guardian covered, like public lands after Trump. So there's an affinity. There's something you care about. And if we know what people care about because we listen, then we can build business models around that. Second, what are the rewards we give people? The only reward we're built to give in media is access to content. But the truth is, people want a lot of other things from us. They would like access to our community. They would like access to journalists. They like access to bargains. They want the knowledge that they've supported something. That's what happens in public radio. They want to be part of a movement and pay for something that matters to them. They want the social capital of saying, look at me, I'm carrying the tote bag I gave to media, I'm a good guy, right? There's a lot of things that people, that might motivate people to give you money in membership. You've got to build models around that. And third is new contributions. Maybe people give you money, but maybe they market you. Maybe they give you content. Maybe they give you effort. We have to value all of these things. So I like membership as a model. Another one is contribution or patronage. The Guardian, as I say, gets money that way. Patreon has tons of people who support singer-songwriters and, and video game players and journalists as well. Kickstarter the same way. Another model of revenue is commerce. We sell things ourselves. The Telegraph, over many years now in London, has sold straw hats and garden sheds and knee braces and clothes hangers and all kinds of weird stuff. They use their audience to sell things. We have a community of practice around commerce at the school, at the Town Knight Center that I direct. And I'm glad to say we convinced one major newspaper chain to start doing commerce. And very shortly, they got a multi-million dollar revenue stream out of selling things to the consumers, to the public they already had. Another revenue stream that was very promising was events. After COVID, not so much. People are doing virtual events. They're charging for it. 
But the event is fascinating because it is a form of content. It's a form of community. It brings people together. It's a form of membership in some cases. And I think once we get back to some new normal or new abnormal, events will come back as a revenue stream. Another one is education. We talked about this last time in terms of the roles. Are we schools in a way? Do we charge people to learn things? The New York Times is doing classes. I think it's possible. And then here's a weird one for you. I was reading the German paper Die Zeit, and I saw a story about a, a small town, medium town newspaper that was delivering beer. And I thought, how German can you get? Uh, and so I talked to the publisher of the paper, and they already had people to deliver newspapers and to deliver advertising from the advertiser to the paper. So they had a logistics staff in place. And when COVID hit and their own customers, the stores, couldn't get to their own customers, the, the, the end consumer, uh, the newspaper came along and said, okay, we'll help out. And they started delivering beer and shoes and office supplies. The publisher said they weren't going to get rich from this, of course. But it was a way to prove their value to their community and to their advertisers and to use their assets. And that's a good way to think. I told this story to our News Innovation and Leadership Management Program run by Anita Zelina, the head of our strategic initiatives. And Anita is Austrian and used to work for the paper Der Standard. And she said, oh, yes, uh, that her paper at one point some years ago bought a bakery so you could get deliveries every day of the newspaper and a croissant. Again, not a way to get rich, but a creative way to think about making money. That's what we're going to need, is many revenue streams, many ways to make money. It means we have more work. I think we're going to figure it out, but it's not going to be easy. and We're going to make mistakes. So you might be saying at this point, okay, Jarvis, forget it all. I'm going not for profit. That's the way. They don't have to worry about this. Sorry. Even not-for-profits have to operate essentially like businesses. It's a difference in taxes and a difference in what happens to the money you get in terms of the taxes for your contributor. But otherwise, if you don't have enough money to pay your bills every month, you go out of business. So you are running a business still. Just you don't own it. And so not-for-profit can be helpful, and it's part of the ecosystem. There are great things like the city in New York, uh, Texas Tribune in Texas, American Journalism Project is helping projects across the country. But the problem here is that there is a limited amount of philanthropic money, much less than the New York Times spends every year, spending on all of journalism in the country. So it's not going to support the level of journalism we need. In addition, as much as we like them, philanthropists uh, have their own agendas. Uh, they have their own power structure and power dynamics. Uh, they take their own sweet time because it's their own sweet money. And they have a bit of ADD in the sense that they might support you this year and maybe next year, but then you're no longer the cool new thing and they want to support something else that's new. So philanthropy can be a route to trying to get some money to run journalism, but it is not going to solve the problem. All right, so now you're going to say, okay, Jarvis, forget all that. We should have a tax. Let's have government support of journalism. It works in the BBC. It can work here. Well, my answer to that the last three years has been two words. Donald Trump. I can't imagine this government presently now having a fund for journalism. And if they did, where it would go? And even before Trump, the uh, Corporation for Public Broadcasting was a political football. It handled a very little bit amount of money, mainly for small public radio stations and public TV stations that had to still have sponsors and still have fund drives and didn't really support them fully. And even so, Life was hell with it. And I know some people in public broadcasting who think that they should give up this crack of government money. But my friends in the UK still say, ah, but Jeff, the BBC, the BBC. And now, unfortunately, I can say two words, Boris Johnson. The problem with government support is that it brings conflict. We are here to report on government, report on the powerful. We talked about that a lot in the last video. I know we're going to talk about it when we get together our role as investigators and watchdogs of those in power. If we find ourselves in a case where we have to lobby those in power for money, we are in a conflict of interest. And believe me, it happens. And we know that in the U.S., again, there was subsidy to news and newspapers in the early days in the sense that mail cost them very little, but nobody mails a newspaper anymore. And they could mail newspapers to each other, but nobody needs to do that anymore. There's also paid legal ads that are in newspapers that newspapers lobby legislatures to keep doing, but they don't need to do that anymore because government can put all this on the web. So I don't see government as a great support. And 
Keep in mind that every single one of these revenue streams that I've raised brings a conflict of interest. Right? Advertising has an obvious conflict of interest. Are you going to be mean to your advertisers? Are you going to report on their uh, bad doings? Um, even the subscriptions bring a conflict of interest because maybe you're just kowtowing to their needs and desires and uh, not really willing to, to, to tell them uncomfortable truths. Uh, commerce brings conflict of interest because will the readers trust that this thing you're recommending in um, Wire Cutter in the New York Times is really the best or are you making money from it? I believe Wire Cutter, but people are going to ask that. Uh, philanthropy brings, brings conflict of interest because they have their own uh, agendas. So this is the moment, if we were all in the same room, at which I would tell uh, Anthony and other people to lock the doors because I don't want to scare you into leaving journalism. It's not that bad. But I want to be honest about this, that these are tough times. These are tough decisions. But once again, this opens you up to the opportunity for change because the old models aren't working anymore and we need new models and we need new structures and we need new ways to think of journalism and the business of journalism and how to support it and what its real value is. That is is your opportunity. So I want to end all of this with a few examples of what you can do. But first, a plug. Jeremy Kaplan, my brilliant colleague here who runs uh, the entrepreneurial journalism programs, you may have heard, has a new program coming out, which is separate from this one, but Jeremy's a resource in the school. And it gives you an indication of how the dean, Sarah Bartlett, is thinking about the future of journalism. She had this idea for this, for this redesigned entrepreneurial program. We used to be concentrated more on starting a company. Now it's concentrated more on the individual resilient journalist. That is to say that you find a community that needs service. You decide to serve that community. You use all kinds of new tools to do that. You can send out email newsletters with Substack. You can start a podcast. You can have a blog on Medium. You can have YouTube videos. You can do all kinds of great things. And you can earn money in lots of ways, right? You can go to Patreon and have patrons give you money. You can go to YouTube and get advertising money there or Medium and get subscriber money there. You can do a book contract. You can create events. You can get patronage directly from your, from your fans. You can get a grant for philanthropy maybe. And so there are ways we think that we're going to see more and more independent, resilient journalists. Look at a company like Substack, which started as an email newsletter company and now is enabling journalists to uh, basically create not only newsletters, but also websites and, and is paying them for it if they have their own paywalls. Again, if the stuff is really worth it. And is even trying to now talk about adding things like insurance and libel insurance and things like that. So there are efforts out there to support journalists. Many of you, most of you, those who want to, will get jobs on media outlets, new or old. Our students do get hired at a high rate. I'm confident this is, this is going to continue, uh, especially by the time you're out of school. I hope and pray, knock wood, things will be a lot better and there'll be a demand for your talent and your resilience. So I think that's going to be for a lot of you. Some of you, though, may want to start a company. That's possible. Some of you may want to become an independent journalist who's serving a community. You have more choices now than you've had before. So I'll let Anthony unlock the virtual door now. And it's not a case that you should be depressed and scared that you're not going to earn a living. It's just the case that you're going to earn it in new ways, in ways that may not be predictable or ways that you may invent. So let me end with a few examples of things that I like, things that aren't necessarily proven yet, but that are new ways to look at journalism. One of my favorite companies is called Spaceship Media, run by a woman named Eve Perlman in California. Remember I said my definition of journalism was to convene communities into respectful, informed, and productive conversation. That is what Spaceship does. In their first outing after the American presidential election in 2016, they found 25 women who voted for Trump in Alabama, 25 who voted for Clinton in San Francisco. And a, and a journalist came and brought them all together online and got to know them a little bit, interviewed them. Then threw them all into a private Facebook group. First day was fine, second day, hell. But then the community members came to the journalist and said, you know, we're getting in trouble over here. Can you look up some stuff for us? Well, in my view at that moment, the heavens opened and the angels sang because what they were saying was, we value an informed conversation. We want facts. 
and we trust you, the journalist, to get them for us. And what Spaceship gives them then isn't a story, or Spaceship doesn't extract this as a story about them so much as it decides right then to give them what they call a fact stack. They say, these are the facts you asked for. These are the facts you're confused about. These are the facts you're wrong about. These are the facts you should know. Here. Remember what I said about James Carey and the conversation? What Spaceship does in its dialogue-driven journalism is to listen to the conversation, see what the conversation needs, and then bring journalism to it. The conversation leads. I love this model. Is the Eve getting rich yet? No. But she's proving a new model of journalism. And I think it's going to work, and I think it's going to work well, and I see others taking this up. Another example is City Bureau in Chicago, where they're highly collaborative. They go and train people to go and cover, let's say, a, a, a board meeting and pay them some money and bring back, and then they have higher-level journalists who can report on top of that. Or outlier media in Detroit that answers people's questions using text to be able to say, what's your problem? And if, they, if you have the same problem everybody else has, they give you an answer. If it's a new problem, they try to find the answer. That notion of serving the public. Um, and then the city here in New York, uh, which as I mentioned, Dean Bartlett helps, helped start. Uh, Terry Paris Jr., who's one of our professors in social journalism, runs their uh, engagement and community efforts. And he runs uh, the Open Newsroom, which is fascinating to watch. And he uses a lot of Social J students in it to um, listen to communities in new ways, to have the community become the agenda setter. That's a new way to look at how we determine what journalism we do. One last story. I ran into a journalist in uh, Germany who told me that, like a uh, spaceship, she was running something new in her town. In that town, in the north of Germany, uh, real estate's really expensive, but they can't really find out too much about it. So she ran bike tours for the newspaper. And people went around, and they come to a building, and the journalist would say, this is what we know about that building and why it's so expensive. And then they come to the next building, and they'd say, we can't find anything about, about this building because we're not allowed to. We can't file a Freedom of Information Act request for this. But tenants can. Does anybody live here in that building? Oh, you do. Can we help you file an information request so we can learn more? And then they end up back and, 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 they, and they socialize. So in one idea, it becomes a journalistic venture where they share information, a journalistic venture where they collaborate on the journalism and the reporting, and an educational event and a social event. She's not getting rich either. My point here is just that there are creative ways to consider how to do journalism. There are creative ways to consider how to support that journalism. So as you come into our school, our wonderful school, and you learn so much about the tools and trade of journalism, keep in mind that you want to ask why we do what we do the way we do it. So maybe, maybe I do it that way, or maybe I can think of a better way. Remember, it's early days. It's 1475 in Gutenberg years. We have a long way to go in my mind. You have time to reinvent journalism. Some people think that, that the internet is already finished and that we know what it is and it's all over. I don't believe that at all. I think we're still seeing the future in the analog of the past. Remember, printing was automated handwriting. The internet still looks like media to some people. They haven't really realized what it is. You can see that differently. Much will fail. And in America, that's okay. We kind of fetishize failure. It's lessons learned. It's things that we can do and learn from and do better. Some of my favorite people around this field have tried multiple things and have failed before they succeeded. It's okay if you can afford it. There is much to learn. And the only way to learn is to listen. Whether you call someone a community or you call them a market, it has the same requirement that you start by listening to their needs, understanding those needs, empathizing with those needs, reflecting those needs, and then trying to serve those needs. That is the essence of journalism on both sides of the ledger, on the journalistic side, and it should be on the business side. My best advice is to look for gaps and fill them. Don't do what everybody else is doing. Look for a community that is underserved, and Lord knows there are many of them more all the time. There are news deserts locally, there are news deserts as communities. There are communities that just do not get attention in mass media that would gobble up the service of journalism if you could provide it to them. 
You might provide them with a Substack newsletter. You might provide them with a podcast. You might provide them with databases. You might provide them with theater. You might provide them with get-togethers and events. I don't know. Don't start with that. Start with their needs and then see all the tools that you can bring. Importantly, uphold standards. That's what journalism is in the end. Everything that you do now, somebody else can do. We all have the same tools now. We have the internet. Everybody can publish text. Everybody can make video. Everybody can tell stories. Everybody can take photos. Everybody can answer TikToks with each other. We can all do the same things. That doesn't make you special anymore. What makes you special is that you have standards, that you're trying to build trust with people because you're trying to help them. So serve communities, be in service to communities is the best thing you can do as a journalist. And I'll say it one more time and I'll say it to you a hundred more times. Start and end by listening. And I say that knowing the full irony that I've done nothing but talk to you and you've had to listen to me, but that's the thing we're stuck with right now thanks to COVID. So I really look forward to the discussions we're gonna have during orientation about all of these topics. I wanna hear all of you and it's gonna be hard to get everybody in in the time. So I'm not going anywhere and I'm happy to have discussions with individuals and groups. I wanna hear your dreams and your goals for journalism. And I wanna help you meet those dreams and goals. So come in, learn, listen, question, improve. Thank you for your attention. Thank you for being here. Thank you for making the courageous decision to become a journalist. We need you. See you soon.